can start. We're gathering yes, up. Yes, yes. Yeah, we can start now. Um, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, whatever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference. Uh, before giving the floor to our dearest guest, I want to introduce our team. Uh, my name is Madonna Ahobadze. I will be the moderator of today's conference. I'm the last year neurosurgery resident in Georgia, Sakatolo, and I'm also PhD candidate in Tbilisi, capital of the Georgia. A couple of words about our online education meetings. They have started with the Professor Hassan Kamil Suju. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. He is a present today as always. He is the program manager of neurosurgery department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital in Turkey. And those lectures go on with the contribution of all the residents and also with the contribution of all the neurosurgeons who have graduated from the same department as well as neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents from nearby countries like mine, Georgia, Sakatolo, Bulgaria, Ukraine, and many others. Uh, now about the protocol of today's meeting, all the microphones will be turned off during the presentation of the lecture to avoid any voice or noise pollution. But you can ask your questions by writing them to the part, uh, chat part of the Zoom program. And at the end of the presentation, your uh, questions as well as your... As, a, as well as your commands and the words of gratitude will be asked to the lecturer and all of them will be discussed, I assure you. Mutual discussion, however, is not appropriate for the format of our meeting. And now, if there is no question from the audience, I would like to introduce our guest. Uh, it is my biggest privilege to present our lecture, lecturer today, Professor David Greer. Uh, he's a chief of neurology at Boston Medical Center uh, and also a professor of neurology at the chair of the uh, Department of the Neurology at Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Greer received his bachelor degree in English literature from William, Co William College and the master's degree in English literature and MD from the University of the Florida and master's degree from the Yale. Uh, he completed an internship in internal medicine and a residency in neurology at the Massachusetts General Hospital, followed by the fellowship training in vascular neurology and your critical care at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Previously, he was Associate Professor of Neurology at the Harvard Medical School and Associate Neuroscientist at the Massachusetts General Hospital before joining the faculty at Yale. Among his many honors and awards, Dr. Greer has been named one of the best doctors in America since 2007. He has received the Yale Neurology Residency Program's Teacher of the Year Award two presidential citations, each from the Society of the Critical Care Medicine and the New Critical Care Society, the Partners Neurology Superman Resident Training Award at the Massachusetts General Hospital. He's an expert in spinal disorders, vascular neurology, neurocritical care, and his research interests include predicting recovery from coma after the cardiac uh, arrest, brain death, uh, multiple stroke-related topics, including acute stroke treatment, temperature modulation, and a stroke prevention. Dr. Greer has authored more than 300 peer-reviewed manuscripts, reviews, chapters, guidelines, and the books, and serves as the reviewer for several of the most prestigious uh, scientific journals, including New England uh, Journal of Medicine, Annals of Internal Medicine, Brain, Neurology, and Stroke. And now, without the further ado, welcome again, Professor. Uh, the virtual stage is yours. You can start sharing your screen. Thank you. Great, and I, I have started sharing my screen. Hopefully you can see okay, it uh, in front of you now. Great. Well, yes, thank you for the invitation to speak with you today. It's really quite an honor. Uh, and I'm happy to speak about one of my favorite subjects, which is brain death. It seems ironic to have that as one of your favorite subjects, but it is for me. Here are some of my disclosures. Uh, none of these are pertinent to today's uh, talk. Uh, for the outline of the talk, I'll talk a bit about the pathophysiology of brain death, as well as the history, uh, which is both uh, global uh, and uh, very U.S.-centric in some ways as well. I try to, I'll try to make this very uh, uh, world-based, because I know this is an international audience as well. I'll go into a bit of detail about the American Academy of Neurology practice parameter update, but also about the World Brain Death Project, which was published uh, in JAMA in uh, 2020. And in the end, I'll 
close with the, the future of brain death and what work is being done both uh, nationally in the US but also internationally to further the field. So first of all, I'd like to start off with a trivia question and uh, I'll ask you, what is this, this object here next to the patient's bedside? Well, it's a ventilator. Mm -hmm. And why do we have a picture of the ventilator so early in the talk? Well, because before we had ventilators, there was no such thing as brain death. Only when we uh, started supporting people from becoming progressively hypoxic after a neurological catastrophe did we have patients that were in this quasi state where they were seemingly alive with their hearts beating and their oxygenation was good, but they had no brain function whatsoever. And so we needed to create this in the 1950s with the advent of the iron lung and more modern ventilators. So now with brain death, the issues go beyond just medical, but also cultural and ethical and legal phenomena as well. The correct determination of brain death is essential for a number of reasons. And I put organ donation last, although some people like to put it first. It is not the only reason or even the most important reason why we do brain death. It's also so that we don't continue to treat a patient who has no hope for uh, benefit from it. We don't do inappropriate measures or procedures on patients who are brain dead. It helps to provide finality for families who are unclear about the prognosis. In the US, if you're brain dead, you are legally dead. And it also helps to preserve vital critical care resources, which are always an issue no matter where you practice. How does brain death occur? Well, you have some kind of a mass lesion, which is causing increased intracranial pressure, which further compromises cerebral perfusion to the point where there is no effective forward flow. As you, this audience very well knows, uh, the skull is a very rigid container and it will not accommodate a whole lot of extra stuff in it. And so as you get a higher ICP, you get no cerebral perfusion pressure and further uh, brain dies with that. For the residents or fellows on the, the, uh, the call today, these are DeRay hemorrhages. These are seen really uh, only uh, in, a, in a fatal catastrophic event with herniation. As you have traction of the brainstem down through the frame and magnum, you get tearing of the small arterioles in the brainstem. So when you see this on your boards, you can thank me because this is the only thing that this would look like. Uh, the background for this, so there are two uh, French physicians who are credited with brain death, Mollery and Goulon, who introduced the term in 1959 when they described 23 patients with irreversible coma in their, uh, their famous sentinel work, Le Coma de Passé. These patients were unresponsive, had no brainstem reflexes, and had no spontaneous respirations, and they all had flat EEGs. Subsequent to that, the Harvard report came out in 1968, which used some of the same criteria and proposed the term brain death the NIH collaborative study in 1977 defined the futility of brain death. And then the President's Commission report in the US affirmed the validity of brain death and proposed guidelines as to how to approach a brain death diagnosis. And this led to the very important Uniform Determination of Death Act, or the UDDA. This served as the basis for the first guidelines from the American Academy of Neurology in 1995. And these quoted the UDDA which said that you could either be dead by the old fashioned way, which was irreversible cessation of all circulatory and respiratory functions, or the new way with irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brainstem. Uh, and they also said that determination of death is made with acceptable medical standards. And what does that mean? That means that the medical community is what determines are the rules around brain death. It's not the uh, politicians, it's not the lawyers, thank goodness. It's the medical community that says, this is how you do it and do it properly. So they were very prudent back in the, in the day to make sure that there was good guidance in this way. So that seemed pretty black and white, uh, at least to a lot of people. But when I first started practicing, I noticed that brain death determination was different in different hospitals in the US. And so we did a survey of uh, the, the 50 uh, best neurology and neurosurgery institutions in the US according to the US News and World Report. We did this back in 2006. Uh, and we looked at their guidelines that they had for their hospitals compared with the AAN guidelines. And we found that there was a lot of vari variability. And we thought that's not a good thing. When you do something of this importance, determining brain death, you need to be absolutely certain and have no false positives. And so that's why we undertook to update the guidelines in 2010 uh, and I, well, I had the pleasure of working with Elko Vedic's 
Panos Varelis and Gary Gronseth on this update, which really tried to serve as a, uh, not only an update for the evidence during that time, but actually also as a practical guide as to how to do it properly and with lots of fail safes. So we asked five evidence-based questions uh, in, that, uh, in, that, in, in that work in 2010. The first one was the most important. Are there patients who fulfilled the clinical criteria of brain death who recovered any neurological function? If the answer to that was yes, we would have a big problem, right? That would mean that our fail-safes that we had to determine brain death were not working. And the good news was there were no legitimate reports that were unconfounded uh, that uh, brain death was uh, done everything perfectly and the patient regained any function. So that was very good news that when you followed this to the letter that uh, the, the diagnosis can be sound. The second question is, what's an adequate observation period to ensure permanent cessation? And we can't put a number to that. Uh, so if in doubt that you think the patient might be reversible based on their condition, then you should wait for longer. You should be absolutely certain that there will be no reversibility of the condition. The, uh, the other disease category to think about is cardiac arrest where patients can have recovery and we, we, uh, we typically wait at least 24 hours in adults and 48 hours in children after cardiac arrest because they can look brain dead and then have delayed recovery. Third question is, are there complex motor movements that are retained in brain death that are actually spinal? And the answer is, of course, there are many movements that are clearly spinally mediated. And we know this because these patients also had ancillary studies at some time in the past that showed that these were actually spinally mediated. And these could be such basic things as a Babinski sign, a triple flexion, deep tendon ref reflexes, or the, the more advanced signs such as the Lazarus signs with head turning, arching of the back, um, and uh, uh, movement of, of the extremities and an extensor-like posturing movement. We looked at the comparative safety of different techniques for determining apnea, and we couldn't really come up with different ways. There are multiple different ways of doing this, including on or off the ventilator. I'll show you a little bit of an on the ventilator approach, but we, there are others as well. Uh, the fifth question is, are there new ancillary tests that can accurately identify brain patients with brain death? And the answer is no. I know that people like to use or want to use CTA. Some people want to use MRA. They have not been validated uh, against the gold standard to a sufficient degree that we felt that it was acceptable to use these uh, at the time. And so please note that those are not currently accepted uh, tests for brain death uh, in the US, uh, nor in the World Brain Death Project for that matter. So many of the uh, guidance that we provided in this document was actually not evidence-based. It's very difficult to study brain death, although we are trying. So what followed in the rest of the paper was what is opinion-based and really what we thought was best practice based on expert opinion. So there are four steps in brain death determination. The first one is re prerequisites, uh, like making sure that there is nothing confounding the exam. Number two is a neurological exam including the apnea test. And a neuro exam always has to be done, even if you know you're going to have to do an ancillary test, uh, because uh, sometimes the, uh, the, uh, the the neuro function may be present and you wouldn't get an ancillary test. So you always do whatever you can do in terms of neurological testing. And the fourth step is uh, documentation. Uh, the prerequisites. So first of all, you have to know why they're in coma and you have to know that it's irreversible. If you have any question or doubt as to the reversibility, you don't determine brain death, you keep on uh, uh, treating the patient until you have a better sense of that. How do you establish the cause and avoid pitfalls? So first of all, you usually know it by the history of the exam and the neuroimaging or any laboratory tests. You wanna exclude a CNS depressant drug effect, and this is important, that many of these patients receive sedatives or narcotics, and you have to make sure that they are cleared based on the drug's half-life, but also considering their metabolism. <coughs> hepatic or renal function that is impaired that needs to come into your, your, uh, your, your thinking. And if somebody's received hypothermia, either for treatment of cardiac arrest or for treatment of uh, increased intracranial pressure, that can delay drug metabolism as well. So that needs to be taken into account uh, as well. So the prerequisites also include absence of paralysis. So if somebody's received paralytics, you have to make sure they're no longer paralyzed. This could be just to, uh, by doing uh, deep tendon reflexes, but it could also be with electrical stimulation or what we call a train of four. 
They should not have any severe electrolyte acid base or endocrine disturbances. We're going to put some harder numbers to this in the future, but right now the guidance is if you think the metabolic abnormality could be severe enough to impact the exam, then don't declare brain death. Try to correct it if you can, or consider getting an ancillary test if you have to. We have a saying in the neuro ICU that you're not dead until you're warm and dead. So you have to have a core temperature of at least 36 degrees Celsius, and you have to have a systolic blood pressure of at least 100. The number of examinations, we said at the time that one exam should be sufficient, but some US states and some countries require two examinations. I'm actually in favor of two examinations. This is such an important diagnosis. Why well, leave it to chance? I think two examinations and actually two blinded examinations is probably the soundest way to go about this. Because if I go in and I, I say to one of my junior faculty, I think they're brain dead. What do you think? They're going to be like, oh, yeah, boss, I think they're, they're brain dead too. And so you, you really should do this in a blinded fashion if possible. And expertise is important. So mostly neurologists and neurosurgeons do this, but some intensivists are very good at this. And I do think that that's permissible as well uh, to consider uh, in, 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 depending on the practice setting. For the neurological assessment, there are three cardinal features, coma, brainstem areflexia, and apnea. So coma means obviously complete unresponsiveness, no eye opening or eye movement, the noxious stimulation and only spinally mediated reflex re responses are seen or no responses. You have to provide noxious stimulation in all four extremities, including the cranium. The patient might have a cervical spine injury or a uh, per severe peripheral neuropathy. So you always provide noxious stimulation on the cranium, which I'll show you. Sometimes you'll see a movement and you're not sure if it's spinal or cerebral in origin. In that case, get somebody more senior to look at it with you. Or if you're still uncertain, you may need to get an ancillary test. Here's a, a, a test of a blink to visual threat. So I come in with my hand flat, as you'll see, and I come in from the sides and right down the center to see if there's any movement. I will tell you that all the patient videos I'm going to show you are not for distribution, but these are with the family's consent. Uh, so these, these were all uh, consented. Here's motor testing, where I give noxious stimulation typically at the nail bed to start with. And you can see this patient is not brain dead. He has eye opening and he has head turning to that. I always mention two spots to see if there is any more complex movement that's seen. I'll show you the legs as well, where this patient actually had different movement depending on where I pinched him. And that looks like a much more complex movement. So this patient is clearly not brain dead. The pupillary assessment, so you can assess this typically with a bright uh, light in either eye. Uh, I use a magnifying glass, which I'll show you, and I also use a pupillometer, which can be great. These are not uh, validated yet in brain death, but there's no reason why you can't use them because they may see something that your naked eye does not. If you see small pupils, meaning less than two millimeters, then you should be worried about the possibility for uh, opiate intoxication. Here's a patient uh, who I'm using a, a magnifying glass. You can see the, there it is. So the light <coughs> with the magnifying glass, so I can really see whether the pupil moves or not. That costs $6. This one is the pupillometer. It costs about $4,500 in the US. And so more expensive, but can be used on multiple different patients as well. Um, but it always checks a second time. If it does not get a response, you're gonna see another flash because it wants to make sure that there is no response as well. There's the other flash and there are zeros for the, the pupils on that one. Corneal reflex. So you wanna to touch the cornea with an adequate stimulus. So that little saline squirt or whatever uh, 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 sterile uh, water or saline that you squirt in, that's good as a screening test but it is not sufficient to say that there is no corneal. So I will take a Q-tip as I show you on the next slide and press on the eye to make sure there's no corneal reflex. And where do you touch on the eye? So here's a heat map that we, we created from 950 neurologists and intensivists worldwide to have them from a survey to see where do you touch on the eye. And most people were pretty far lateral on the eye. Some people miss the eye entirely, which is just sad. But most of the uh, most of the people have the heat map way out here. The farther you get from the border of the iris, the less sensitive the eye. So I say to press right adjacent to the iris right here, which I will now show you uh, in this video. 
So it looks a little bit gross, but probably not for this audience. Uh, so you hold the eyes open and I wanna see the globe move slightly with that light pressure. You're not gonna injure the eye. You're not gonna puncture the eye with this, but this is how you know that the corneal reflex is definitely absent. And then the doll's eye or doll's head maneuver. I don't know what, uh, when somebody writes doll's plus or doll's minus in the chart, I don't know what that means. So I, I like the term oculocephalic reflex. That's a much more accurate term. And there's also oculovestibular reflex or the cold caloric testing. So the oculocephalic or the doll's head maneuver is only tested when you have the integrity of the C-spine and which often isn't the case in neurosurgery, that patients can have trauma. And so you would not, this would be the one thing you can skip, that is okay, but you cannot skip the cold caloric test. But in a, a patient where you have certainty about the C-spine integrity, here's how you test it. So you wanna secure the ET tube, the endotracheal tube. So I'll hold on to that and the patient's face at the same time. It's a two hand maneuver, so I'm, not dislodging or really moving the endotracheal tube very much and briskly rotating the patient's head side to side. In brain death, the eyes do not move. Here is my non-brain dead friend, uh, Dr. Goldenberg, who's showing you a normal reflex. As he turns his head, the eyes move in the opposite direction of the head. That's obviously not the case in brain death. The ocular vestibular test, or the cold caloric test, you cannot skip this one. So to test this correctly, First of all, you look in the auditory canal and the tympanic membrane to make sure that it's free of blood and cerumen or whatever matter might be in there. You elevate the head of the bed to 30 degrees. That gets you the proper orientation of the horizontal semicircular canals. You irrigate one ear at a time with ice water continuously, and you're observing it for eye movements for at least one minute. And both ears need to be tested and you wait five minutes before testing the opposite ear. So this is really a two-person operation. You'll see a third hand come in and hold the eyes open. I'm using some butterfly tubing because it makes it easier. And I'm collecting ice cold water after squirting into the patient's ear for 60 seconds uh, into this uh, basin, as you can see here. You don't want to make a mess in the bed. The nurse will yell at you. If they, they yell at me all the time. And so take care to be able to catch the, uh, the fluid as it comes out. But you wait for 60 seconds. In brain death, there should be no eye movements. And somebody who is not brain dead and their brainstem is intact, the eyes will move tonically toward the cold irrigated ear, and you may get some nystagmus away. But the more, the more um, uh, potent response is actually tonic movement towards the cold irrigated ear. So for any residents on the call, that is the intact response. There are potential confounders for the oculocephalic and oculovestibular. So ototoxic drugs, including aminoglycosides and some of these other drugs that you can see there, trauma to the globes, the orbits of the petrous bone, and then uh, severe globe or facial edema. These are all things that could cause a restrictive problem for the eyes to move. There should be no facial movement to noxious stimulation. So where do I touch on the face? So that the, uh, do a nasal tickle, which I'll show you where I stick a Q-tip up the nose and wiggle it around. Sounds gross, but it's very benign. Uh, put pressure on the temporomandibular joint and pressure on the supraorbital notch or ridge, which is about two thirds out from the eyebrow, from medially uh, or laterally from starting medially from the eyebrow. And that's where the supraorbital nerve comes out, as you all know. Facial myokinias are permissible when there's denervation, uh, but they cannot happen in response to any anything that you do externally to the patient. There should be no gag reflex when you stimulate the posterior pharynx with a tongue blade or a suction device. And there should be no cough reflex with a deep bronchial suctioning, at least at the level of the carina. And there should be no spontaneous respirations above the set rate on the ventilator. So here is a nasal tickle. I'm gonna stick a Q-tip up this person's nose. And you can see that there is no movement to that. Here's a patient who has notable grimacing. With that, obviously not a brain dead patient. That's a normal response. Here's what a gag reflex looks like. I know this is uh, all review for everybody here. You open the, the mouth as best you can and poke on both sides of the palate as best you're able to. And then here's the cough reflex for residents. Again, straighten out the ET tube is going to make it easier to pass the inline suctioning down, and you really pass it down to the hilt 
uh, to make sure that you're, you've gotten deep enough to stimulate a cough reflex if they would have one. So now I'm gonna show you a brief video that's gonna cover all of this. This was published in the New England Journal uh, last the year. Auditory response by calling the patient's name loudly. Yeah. Rub the sternum, apply supraorbital pressure or pressure at the temporomandibular joint. Apply deep noxious stimulation to the nail bed and proximally on all extremities. In a brain dead patient, noxious stimuli should not produce grimacing, facial muscle movement, or a motor response of the limbs other than spinal immediate reflexes. Note that patients with severe peripheral neuropathy or cervical spinal cord injury may not elicit a motor response. To assess for a blink response to visual threat, bring the examiner's hand directly into the center of their field of vision at close range <laughs> to observe whether they blink. In the case of brain death, this should not elicit a blink response. To test cranial nerves two and three, open the eyelids and assess the position of the eyes and size of the pupils. In brain death, the eyes are typically mid position and fixed. In brain death, the pupils should be in mid position and typically four to six millimeters in diameter, but they can be any shape. Small diameter pupils less than two millimeters are not consistent with brain death and may suggest the presence of medications or toxins like narcotics, or that the patient is potentially in a locked in state in which a patient cannot move due to damage to the corticospinal tracts. Shine a bright light in each eye to test the pupillary light reflex. A magnifying glass helps the examiner identify any evidence of pupillary reactivity. In brain death, the pupils are non-reactive to both direct and consensual stimulation. One can also use an automated pupillometer, although this has not been studied systematically in brain death and should not be used in isolation. Be aware that intraocular installation of mediatic medications may temporarily render pupils non-reactive. Additionally, ocular or corneal trauma, orbital edema or anophthalmia may preclude adequate pupillary evaluation requiring the use of ancillary testing. To elicit the corneal reflex, which is mediated by cranial nerves five and seven, apply pressure to the cornea at the border of the iris in both eyes using cotton swab on a stick and monitor for a blink response or more subtle closure of the eyelids. No eyelid movement should be seen in brain death. Be careful not to damage the cornea. Insert a cotton swab into the nares to assess for facial movement. There should be no facial movement. Perform the oculocephalic test, also called the doll's head maneuver, only in patients with a stable cervical spine, and make sure the endotracheal tube remains secure during these maneuvers. Open the eyelids and rapidly turn the head side to side. Observe for any eye movement in response to head turning. There should be no movement with brain death. Before performing the oculovestibular test, also called the cold caloric test, assess the patency of both auditory canals and the presence of intact tympanic membranes. If the tympanic membrane is not intact, installation of fluid could cause an infection. To perform the oculovestibular test, elevate the head of the bed 30 degrees. Have one examiner hold the eyelids open while a second examiner instills 50 milliliters of ice cold water into the ear canal using tubing long enough to reach the middle ear while observing the eyes. In a normal patient, the eyes would have a slow component of tonic deviation towards the cold water, followed by a fast component of nystagmus in the opposite direction. Okay, I think we'll move on from that uh, simulation because you get the point. Uh, I will advocate that simulation-based training in brain death is terrific. I've done this with uh, neurosurgeons, both at Yale, but also uh, here at Boston Medical Center, and it's always a great ex exercise for the, uh, the trainees. And so uh, if you want my, my guidance as to the, the different scenarios that we used uh, for our simulation here, I'm very happy to share it with you. The apnea test is a very important uh, and, and the, the arguably the last part of the clinical exam to be done. So the prerequisites are the patient needs to be normal tensive, and that's defined as at least 100 millimeters of mercury um, uh, systolic. Uh, and that's with or without vasopressors. Now, I will say that if somebody has a very borderline blood pressure, they're just barely above 100, I try to get them to at least 110 or 120 uh, before the apnea test because they can easily get hypotensive if they are an unstable patient. So I try to give myself a bit of a, 
a buffer, if you will. Again, they need to be normal thermic and they should be euvolemic. So many of the patients who become brain dead also have diabetes insipidus, and that can cause a negative fluid balance, which will put them at high risk for hypotension during the test. So you want to make sure that they are euvolemic as best possible prior to starting the apnea test. You should also establish eucapnea with a PCO2 of at least 35 to 45 uh, in that range. Uh, and it, unless they are a known retainer of carbon dioxide, such as for COPD or, or sleep apnea, if you know what their baseline uh, uh, CO2 is, then you need to get to 20 points above that. But that should be the baseline that you start the apnea test at. For example, if they live at a CO2 level uh, of 50, then you start your test at 50 and you need to get to at least 70 uh, for the PCO2 by the end of the test. They shouldn't be hypoxic uh, before the test. In fact, they shouldn't be hypoxic during or after the test. The hypoxia is not what's gonna stimulate to, them to breathe, it's the hypercarbia and the acidosis. In fact, if they get hypoxic, they're much more likely uh, to fail the test uh, due to hypotension. So you really wanna adequately pre-oxygenate the patient for at least 10 minutes with 100% FiO2, getting them to a PaO2 of at least 200. Uh, you wanna reduce the in ventilation to establish eucapnea and reduce the, the, the PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure to five. And if they desaturate when you do that, then they may be a patient that's unlikely to do well with the apnea test. You may still try, but if they're already desaturating at a PEEP of five, they may not do very well. I recommend disconnecting the patient from the ventilator. A lot of the more modern ventilators are very sensitive. So if somebody bumps the bed, it could trigger a breath. If there's water in the tubing, it could trigger a breath and that would not be a patient initiated breath. And so you might be falsely misled. So I personally try to do this whenever possible with the ventilator not connected to the patient, but still preserving oxygenation by a catheter that's dropped down the endotracheal tube with a flow rate of about four to six liters per minute. That catheter should be no greater than 70% of the diameter of the endotracheal tube lumen, because otherwise you may actually block the outflow of air, and that may cause barotrauma to the patient. So particularly in a patient who has a small airway, a small endotracheal tube, use a small catheter. I like to bear the chest of, and the abdomen of the patient so I can look for any respiratory movements at all. And I'm standing at the foot of the bed because then I can look at the patient and I can look at the monitor, make sure that their vital signs are staying stable, make sure they're not breathing. And I stand down there for at least 10 minutes. You abort the test if the systolic goes less than 90 or if the O2 sac goes less than 85%. And I don't wait for 30 seconds uh, as per the AAN rules. If they're really driving down their uh, oxygen levels, I get them back on the ventilator as soon as I can. Um, if they were hypoxic during the test, you can retry either using a T-piece or CPAP or having a higher um, flow rate of the oxygen during the test. If there was no respiratory effort observed, you repeat an ABG typically at 10 minutes. You can also send it at five and eight minutes to, to see if you had to abort, you might have reached your numbers earlier than that. But if they did not breathe and the PCO2 is 60 or greater or a 20, 20 point increase over an elevated baseline, then the apnea test is positive. You can never determine somebody with less than 60, but you can with more than 60 for the PCO2. Keep that in mind. If the test was inconclusive, let's say they got to 58 or 59 with their PCO2, but they didn't breathe and they were stable, you can repeat the test for longer, up to 15 minutes. I've heard 33 minutes is the longest I've heard the test to go for. I would not have the courage to do it for that long. But again, you have to adequately pre-oxygenate the patient and reestablish normal capnia before doing that. If the patient becomes hypotensive during apnea testing, or even if they don't, I like to hyperventilate them as soon as I get them back on the ventilator, uh, because that's going to uh, increase their, uh, or, or, or it's going to blow off their PCO2 faster and correct their respiratory acidosis that you just caused intentionally. So it'll help to get the patient more stable more quickly. Potential complications of uh, the apnea test, the most common complication is hypotension when we don't adequately pre-oxygenate patients. 
Tension pneumothorax and cardiac arrest have both been reported, but are rare. Common pitfalls in brain death clinical testing include medications, that's the biggest one, making sure that there's no confounding, severe facial uh, or pupillary abnormalities, facial trauma, uh, acid base disorders, electrolyte disorders, and then the issue with uh, CO2 retention that I mentioned earlier. When do you get ancillary testing? Well, I would say don't get it in everyone unless you need it. I would say brain death is a clinical diagnosis and can be made clinically the majority of the time. You only need ancillary testing when you cannot fully complete the clinical exam or you can't safely do apnea testing, that's a big one, or if the clinical exam is drawn into questions such as if you see a movement and you're not sure if it's spinal or if it's cerebral. Keep in mind that even ancillary testing has potential confounding as well, so your clinical judgment really remains paramount. The preferred tests are a SPECT nuclear medicine study, a conventional catheter cerebral angiogram, and transcranial Doppler. We don't recommend using EEG anymore. Uh, remember that EEG really only is reading what's going on in terms of cortical activity. It does not measure what's going on in the brainstem. So if you were to use EEG, you also need a brainstem test such as evoke potentials uh, to uh, ensure uh, that there is no electrical activity going on in the brainstem. So I really don't recommend EEG. A conventional angiogram should show absence of flow in all intracranial arteries. Contrast will fill the external carotid circulation, which also supplies the meningeal arterial system. Uh, the ICA and the vertebral artery flow should arrest at the point of entry at the dura. Here's what it looks like. You can see that it comes up and just arrests right at the, at the skull base, but there is filling of the external carotids here. A SPEC study, we typically will use a lipophilic tracer. Uh, there are lipophobic tracers as well, but the nice thing about lipophilic is that it looks at both the vasculature and any uptake of tracer in metabolically active tissue whereas a lipophobic uh, tracer would not look at any, uh, uh, anything it crosses through the blood-brain uh, barrier, it would stay within the vessels. Given that there's a persistent extracranial circulation, you can see meningeal circulation and skull vessels, and your nose is very well vascularized, so there's the, the empty light bulb sign, the hot nose sign. You always need to look laterally because that's the only way that you're gonna be able to see the brainstem, and remember, that's the last to go. And you also want to look at planar views to make sure that there's no perfusion in the brainstem. Here's an EEG. I know it looks like an EKG because that's EKG artifact that you're seeing. That's all that you see. Otherwise, it should be completely flat. A transcranial Doppler examination, you want to do both anterior and posterior, two examinations 30 minutes apart. I do not rely on the absence of flow. I look for, you have to have some signal that looks like this. So very sharp systolic spikes, and then either going to zero at diastole or even better, flow reversal at diastole. That tells you that your intracranial pressure is higher than your mean arterial pressure. It's basically hitting a wall and bouncing right back. And so that is the signature uh, TCD that you would see in brain death. Again, MRA and CTA are not prospectively studied against um, a gold standard and are not yet validated. So stay tuned on that. The time of death, at least in the US, is a time that the, the blood gas is reported by the lab, or if an ancillary test was required, it's when the attending physician signs the report. That is the time of death legally in the US. This is the checklist that we use from the American Academy of Neurology. You don't need to read it. I know it's very small, but I like to put it up there to remind you to use a checklist every time you do a brain death evaluation. It's not like any of the stuff I showed you was rocket science, right? But there's a lot of things to remember. You need to, you need to make sure you're checking all the boxes when it comes to brain death, otherwise you may miss something. So how's the variability going? I, I mentioned in the beginning that there was variability back in the 2000s when I first started out. We did look at how the, the world is now changing their guidelines. And I can tell you that the variability is decreasing significantly, uh, both within the US, but also within different countries. And as the AAN comes out with new criteria this year, we will again re-examine this to make sure that people are updating their guidelines to stay current with what the most uh, uh, up-to-date guidance is. 
So in the last bit here, I'll talk to you about the World Brain Death Project. And as you can see, there were a lot of authors on this in this JAMA publication. Uh, and, and most of these were international authors. So this was a real labor of love by many people working globally. Uh, this was endorsed by 27 international societies. And our goal was to really provide guidance and promote consistent, consistency to brain death determination worldwide. So we were thrilled that they published this in JAMA, but they not only published the main paper, but 17 supplements as well which was great. So here are the different supplements that are all part of the publication that are uh, should be free for you to download. We tried to provide guidance about what's going on worldwide, the science of brain death and concept of brain death, but also very clear guidance about minimum clinical criteria and ancillary studies. We also included a chapter on, on pediatric brain death, ECMO, targeted temperature management, and even some issues such as legal and religious issues around uh, brain death. And then very importantly, we had research questions at the end. So we don't want the field to stop here. We asked 50 or more research questions that need to be uh, uh, settled in the field to move the field forward. Probably the most important chapter is kind of what I've already shown you, which is the minimum clinical criteria. We really want clinicians to err on the conservative side and use a checklist. If in doubt, as to whether the patient could be brain dead or not, do not declare them, okay? That's the big take-home take message. You have to be absolutely certain we cannot have uh, false positives with this. We provided data regarding the potential confounders, including you know, what the disease process is, as well as what parts of the exam uh, could be confounded. We provided some guidance regarding drug half-lives, the most commonly used drugs you can see here, not only in terms of their half-lives, but how they might uh, have uh, decrease metabolism or increase metabolism based on uh, different factors. We provided guidance regarding different spinal reflexes, which have been reported. This is a great reference for you. And we provided very strict examination guidance, just like I've just done in this talk. We also provided very strict guidance regarding apnea testing, which is again, where you have to be very meticulous. We provided a lot of information regarding the ancillary tests that can be used, including the tests of cerebral blood flow that you see here and their pluses and minuses, and even unapproved tests such as CTA and MRA. And we devoted an entire section as to why CTA cannot be used yet. I'd be interested to hear whether you are using it in your parts of the world, but we have recommended against it both in the AAN as well as in the World Brain Death Project. We do go into tests of electrophysiologic function, but again, de-emphasize their importance uh, for the most part, unless that's the only resource that you have because they are flawed. And again, these are some of my favorite supplements in there. We provided a flow diagram if somebody did get treated with therapeutic hypothermia and how you handle that, how long you should wait, and how do you handle drug metabolism. And then again, of course, a very important checklist, uh, which needs to be present whenever you go to the bedside, including for apnea testing and ancillary testing. Here are the different religious stances on brain death. This comes up certainly all over the world as well, that there could be objections to brain death based on religious uh, stances. And so this is where some of the religions, the major religions of the world stand on, uh, uh, on brain death. Uh, finally, I will say that the adult and pediatric guidelines in the US are different. And that's a problem. Many of the legal challenges that we've seen in the US have come in pediatric uh, cases and so uh, my friends, uh, uh, Matt Kirshen and uh, uh, Arian Lewis, they did a great job of pointing out the differences between the adult and uh, ch uh, children guidance uh, in the US. And I can tell you with uh, a very happy heart that we now have uh, combined guidance that will be coming out from the American Academy of Neurology this year uh, that will be combining both adult and pediatrics. And so. We realize that children are different. They have different blood pressures, different cranial physiology for sure. And that will be a uh, carve out, if you will, of what do you do in these specific circumstances? But most of the stuff around brain death can be shared between adult and pediatrics. And so that should hopefully again be coming out later this year. So what are we doing otherwise to improve the field? We have now an online training and certification course, which is part of the Neurocritical Care Society. So if all you have to do is Google Brain Death Toolkit, and it'll bring you right to the site through Neurocritical Care Society. 
And this online training and certification course uh, will be updated when the, uh, the new AAN guidelines come out as well. I again recommend simulation training and I'm a big fan of champions. A champion is someone at your institution who does a lot of brain death, who knows a lot of brain death, who's able to teach you other people about brain death, especially trainees. And so have one or two people who are really your authorities and carry the torch to make sure that this is done well every time. In the US, we're trying to lobby for a change of the Uniform Determination of Death Act that says that the AAN uh, guidelines are the standard, the legal standard that should be used in the US. And so stay tuned for that. Uh, there is no international standard right now, but many people do use the World Brain Death Project, especially so, since it was so widely endorsed. There is an American Academy of Neurology position statement on accommodation and pregnancy. Accommodation is what do you do when a family refuses to accept brain death? How do you accommodate them in a, in a reasonable way without keeping things going indefinitely? So there is a position statement on that as well as, to, as what to do uh, with a, pre a pregnant patient uh, who is brain dead, but their fetus may be viable. I mentioned the merging of the adult and child guidelines coming out very soon and the brain death toolkit as well. So I hope I've given you something to think about and I will stop sharing and be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gray, for your wonderful lecture. It was very comprehensive and informative. Uh, before I go to the chat, I will use my privileges as a moderator. I'm gonna ask first question. Uh, so you mentioned the differences between adults and uh, uh, pediatric uh, population. Uh, and you said that like after cardiac arrest, you wait 24 hours in adults, 48 hours in ch uh, children. Are there any major differences uh, concerning that we need to remember uh, in children, for example? Yeah. Right, so there are a couple, a couple of things. So the cranial physiology is probably the biggest one. So in children, the, 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 the bone uh, sutures don't fuse until around at the latest two years. And so before then you have to be very understanding that they're going to be able to accommodate more pressure. So they're going to be more resilient in that way. And that means also some of the ancillary tests like transcranial Doppler have not been validated in children. And you need to think about either using uh, conventionally angiogram or a, a spec study. They still like to use EEG in children and think that it would pick up uh, activity from the brainstem. I'm not sure, uh, but you know, it's hard to argue with the, with the pediatricians about this. And so you, you pick your battles, as we say, uh, but certainly in terms of thinking about potential reversibility, that's why they wait 48 hours in children with cardiac arrest and they tend to be much more conservative. They also um, mandate not just two exams, but two apnea tests as well yeah. in pediatrics. Um, and the apnea test is actually safer in children. It's very, very <laughs> uncommon that a kid will uh, decompensate with, uh, with an apnea test. And so the pediatric pediatricians are not going to budge on that one. And so likely the new guidelines will say one apnea test in adults and two in children, but that remains to be seen what the final uh, result of those new guidelines will be. Okay, and what about the pregnant patient? When a patient you are about to diagnose with brain that is pregnant? Well, uh, you would still, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you would still diagnose them, but the question is whether you would continue to support them mm -hmm. from an organ standpoint so that you could actually potentially deliver the fetus. And so in that circumstance, you're certainly going to be getting your uh, obstetrician uh, colleagues involved so they can say, you know, how does the fetus look? Are they doing okay? Are they not doing okay? And can we support the organs uh, for longer to allow the fetus to mature and then be delivered? They can either sometimes do it vaginally, but sometimes they'll do a cesarean section uh, to deliver the, the fetus uh, safely. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, responses. Now I'm going to read the chat. Uh, Izmir Online Neurosurgery, is there a cough reflex in the, a brain death? No, Professor absolutely Greer? not. Yeah. No. no. Mm -hmm. they, 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 uh, there is no cough reflex. That is certainly a brain mediated reflex. And I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear before, but there should be no cough and no gag. Mm -hmm. Professor Gree explains brain death very clearly. Thank you. Mark Andre, medical student from Georgia in Georgia. Uh, how would you differentiate between locked in with no eye movement and the brain death? 
Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So a locked-in patient is actually conscious. So a locked-in mm -hmm. patient can still open their eyes and they can still move their eyes vertically uh, even to communicate with you. There's a famous book called the, the Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which was written by a patient in a locked-in state. So they, he learned how to communicate and have a life. It actually was made into a movie as well. So locked in is a conscious state, that's number one. And they do have uh, some brainstem um, uh, activity still preserved. And so that's a very clear differentiation between locked in state and brain death. Thank you very much for the reference as well. <laughs> uh, it was uh, Hakan uh, Karabaglu from uh, Turkey's writing. Uh, it was the most comprehensive and instructive brain death presentation I've ever seen, especially the audiovisual was very useful. Both our department and the reanimation team uh, of our hospital followed it with interest. Thank you very much, Professor David. Uh, now, uh, Charatay Unel from Malatya Ununu University Department of Neurosurgery from Turkey uh, is writing. Uh, thank you very much for the instructive lecture with ex uh, extensive scientific information. <laughs> is there a documented importance of duration for the diagnosis of brain death from the point of organ donation candidacy? Sincerely, Charatay Unel. Yeah, so it's a great question. and and. Um... I would say that the longer that the patient is in a brain dead state, the more likely it is that they could decompensate uh, and potentially become more unstable. However, that does not mean you should rush to make the diagnosis. You make the diagnosis when it's appropriate, as early as you can, but again, not trying to rush it because you want to make sure that all of your prerequisites are met, that there's no confounding, and that you've had a very sound process uh, involved in this. And so, they're brain dead when they're brain dead, is what I like to say. And you do it as expediently as you can, but without cutting any corners. Uh, the organ donation people always want it to be on the sooner side because that's gonna provide more viable organs, which is a very noble and important um, aspect of this. But from my side, the neurological side, I wanna make dead sure, sorry for the pun, uh, that, the, uh, that the patient is truly brain dead. Because the worst thing that could happen is that they take them to the OR uh, to harvest their organs and the patient's not brain dead. They take a breath on the table or they have some kind of a response. And so we can never let that happen. So I would say as soon as possible, but without cutting any corners. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I see that neurosurgeon from Turkey, Bektaş Açıkkız, is writing the question. Thank you very much, Professor Greer, for the important presentation and the sharing your ex uh, experience with us. In Turkey, neurosurgeons, uh, after brain death the diagnosis, we give information to the family. And after that, we call the state secretary uh, for the health uh, for transplantation procedures. Um, yeah, uh, that's how it works in Turkey. What's the, uh, Dr. Bektaş, maybe you want to ask your question? Uh, Dr. Hassan, can you unmute yeah. Dr. Bektaş? Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I only underlined the procedure in Turkey. We have to call the state secretary and the transplantation procedures go on after then. Uh, and some other uh, neurologists or neurosurgeons confirm the diagnosis. And after the diagnosis, they ask the family for transplantation. Yeah, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, in the US, we are required that by federal and state law to always call the, they're called the organ procurement organization that works with us locally. Um, and we usually call them before we pronounce somebody brain dead so that they understand that there's a potential organ donor and then they could be prepared uh, to meet with the family once we do declare them. Um, the family communication piece, I didn't speak very much about, but it is very important. Uh, and sometimes I'll even let families be there while I do a brain death determination, uh, the examination and, and the apnea test. It's very powerful for them to see 10 minutes go by where nothing is happening. There's no, no respiratory effort at all as well. They're not connected to the ventilator. That's very powerful. If a family is having trouble understanding, you know, how bad it is, that can be extremely uh, helpful. So I don't know if that's been your practice uh, in Turkey and the rest of the world as well, but 
that's something that I've done more and more here in the US. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned it perfectly. So breaking the bad news uh, is also part of the job, right? And as for a young neurosurgeon, I was wondering, you made me, maybe you have some like tips how to make it better to convey to the family or so, like, uh, you have any tips or yeah, advices? I, I do. Uh, so um, number one is make sure that your first meeting with the family is not when you're telling that their loved one is brain dead. OK, you have to establish a relationship with them first. You can tell them that they've had a very serious brain injury. You can tell them that you are very worried that they may not have any brain function and that you're going to do further testing. But you're very concerned about this. You can bring up the concept of brain death. You can say, I'm worried that they may be brain dead. And here's what that means, that they have permanent irreversible loss of all function of their whole brain. Right. And they need to start hearing those words. But their first meeting with you can't be, I'm so sorry, your loved one is dead and now we're going to take their organs. I'm being a little gratuitous, but um, you know what I'm trying to say. So establish a relationship. I say also, you need to be firm. When they say, if I say, I'm sorry, your loved one is dead. I, I also say the time of death was you know, 11.45 a.m. So that makes it very finite for them. And if they say to me, well, how do you know? Well, I talk to them about all the testing <laughs> I did. And I say, and if they say, isn't there a chance that they could recover or that there's any, um, you know, miracle that could happen? I try to say there's, there are no miracles in medicine. We're scientists and this is what we know. And we've done all the testing that we need to, to be absolutely certain. And I would not be telling you this unless I was absolutely 100% certain. I never want to be wrong about this. And so that's how I try to approach it. But if they need a little bit more time, Give a finite amount of time. Let's meet again in two or three hours. Or if we have to, let's meet again tomorrow. But we're not going to drag this on indefinitely because they will sometimes try to do that. Thank you very much for your honest uh, response. And we have two more questions. Mariam Natsulishvili uh, from Georgia. Uh, hello from Georgia. I'm fifth student, a uh, fifth year student of the new, uh, medical faculty, New Vision University, who loves uh, neuro so much. First of all, thanks for the interesting and deep presentation. I'm interested in: Do you have information what percentage of the misdiagnosed uh, brain death, and what do you think can be the reason and causatives uh, of misdiagnosis? What uh, issues can affect it? So I think it follows misdiagnosis. Yeah, yeah, I would love to know what that percentage is. I hope that it's very low, but people don't report that, right? They don't say, mm -hmm. oh, here, I'm going to publish a report on a patient I misdiagnosed with brain. <laughs> so we don't know what the actual percentage is. The risk for it happens typically when people are not careful about the reversibility and mm -hmm. specifically about any medications that could be influencing the exam or the effect of hypothermia. When I've seen it uh, done, that's when it when it happens. They also, in patients who have a primary brainstem like hemorrhage uh, and they look brain dead, those are very difficult unless they actually go on to get obstructive hydrocephalus that doesn't get treated and they get secondary hypoxic ischemic injury. I don't, I don't do isolated brain death. I think that that is a, a potential cause for misdiagnosis as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Chata Yunel has another question. How many doctors are sufficient to diagnose a case of brain dead? One, two, three, four, more. Uh, do medical disciplines have advantages over each other uh, from your point of view? What do you think uh, about the idea that after the establishment of documented brain death, the body should belong to the state for the sake of more organ donation and transplantation surgeries? Okay, so we're getting into some uh, more challenging questions. So how many, I think personally, at least two. Uh, in, in your country where you practice, they may say it needs to be three or four, but I think a bare minimum should be two, personally. Um, mm -hmm. Do medical disciplines have advantage over each other? Well, I think that neurologists and neurosurgeons do this best because we do it all the time. However, if an intensivist who's doing coma exams all day, uh, every day, and they're good at it, and I've seen them trained, 
I'd be comfortable with medical intensivists as well. But so I don't have a strong preference. I would also say a neurologist who, let's say they're a movement disorder doctor who never goes into the ICU, they may not be very good at this, right? So whoever it is, I want them to be really good at it and very comfortable with it. So that's, rather than saying as one discipline is better than another, I would say whoever's doing it should be well-trained. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the uh, should it belong to the state, that's very controversial. Um, and certainly in the US, we can't do that. We can't do it without consent of the family, but maybe in other countries where it's a bit more paternalistic and the, the good that can come from this in terms of organ donation and saving other lives, maybe a country would prioritize that. The US has done, I think what it can, because on our driver's license, if it says that you wanna be an organ donor, then you're an organ donor. If you're brain dead, even if, if your family disagrees, you said it, you own it. So that's the way it works in the US. It's kind of a weird law, but that's what it is. Thank you. Uh, and last question, Abdullah uh, al Hada. How to explain to the family Lazarus sign? Yeah, great question. So if somebody has abnormal movements and it looks like they're alive, you have to explain to them that this has been seen and we know that it's coming from the, the spinal cord. I like to show them the pictures of their loved one's brain and show them the catastrophe that's happened. Sometimes that can help. And sometimes they need an ancillary test to be absolutely sure and that can provide additional information. I don't like to get an ancillary test in everyone, but if it's going to help a family to become more accepting of it, sometimes I'll do it in that circumstance as well. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your contribution, for your questions. Dr. Hassan, maybe you have a comment or a question? I want to thank Dr. Greer. Uh, I want to thank everyone who joined us. It was a brilliant lecture, very understandable. Thank you so much. And I want to ask if someone uh, want to talk about- Yes, from the audience, if anyone wants to ask a question. Or... Give the lecture. Professor Karabala, you want to say something? Uh, what can I say? Thank you very much, Dr. David. Uh, everything was everything. explained, neither too much nor too little. I will uh, watch again from the YouTube. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.